Go ahead and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 11. Just this, thanks. Matthew chapter 11. It's good to see you today. And I'm just going to be honest, I feel like I just have a lot this morning. Like it's going to just be a lot, not like heavy and aggressive. Sometimes when I say that, that's kind of how it comes off, isn't it? But um, so I'm just going to, you know, just take something from this morning. I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground. I'm excited about it, so I'm just going to roll with it. Praise the Lord. We are uh, in week two of a series we started last week called Loving God. Out of the great commandment that uh, Jesus affirmed to us in Mark chapter 12, I'm going to read that real quick before we get to Matthew 11. It says, one of the scribes came to Jesus and heard people disputing with one another and seeing that Jesus had answered the people well, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you Everybody say, that's me. me. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. If this is the greatest commandment, I reckon we should get good at it. And I want to talk about this morning, how do we grow in loving God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength? Last week, we talked about loving God with all our heart, and we kind of talked about how We're going to talk about these as four things, but these are not four distinct things. All of these things are all of you, so we're not trying to, I'm not going to be the smart guy who draws the line between what exactly the heart is and how it's different from the soul. We're just taking God's commandment. What he's saying is the great commandment is for you and me to love God with all of our, all of us. That's what he wants. We talked about our heart last week and zoomed in on our desires this week, we're going to talk about loving God with all of our soul. I shared last week about how a few years ago, I was meditating on the great commandment and, you know, how am I doing at loving God on these four things? I felt like I knew kind of how to love God with my heart and with my strength, but my mind and my soul kind of felt a little bit foreign to me. And I'm going to be honest, the soul part was the most foreign of the four to me. Uh, I meant it when I said it last week. I genuinely, as I started to think about loving God with all my soul, I was Honestly asking God the questions, you know, like, Lord, okay, what is a soul? And honestly, do I even have one of those? Like, where where do I find it? And then how do I love you with that thing? So uh, this has been a real eye-opener for me, and uh, I hope that this uh, helps you today as well. Um, Learning to love God with my soul has been a game changer, and I pray that for all of us. So go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Jesus for that invitation and for that promise. And I pray for me and for my friends here this morning, teach us, because that sounds great. Come Holy Spirit, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. So we've said that we're not talking about heart, soul, mind, and strength in four extremely distinct ways, but we also kind of are for the sake of talking about them. So what, when we talk about the soul, what, what is it that we're, we're kind of going to zoom in on this morning? What part of you are we talking about? In Hebrews, or I mean in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we read last week, which is what Jesus quotes in Mark 12, the word for soul, kind of one of the definitions for the, the word for soul that is used there is the seat of emotions and passions. We talked about the heart last week as the seat of desire. As we're talking about the soul, we're kind of getting that. What's the the seat of emotions and passions inside of you? In Mark chapter 12, the Greek word soul is the word that we get psyche from. So you're talking about your psyche, where we get psychology. So 
uh, that's the treatment of moods and personality. It's the study of your mind and behavior. So you're trying to, we're starting to get a little bit of a feel for what part of you we're talking about. Just like all of this, when we talk about your soul, we're talking about you. It's, it's your, your insides. You're, you're, you're you in there. It's your personality. It's your emotions. It's your you down in there. One way to say it is like your soul is kind of the thing beneath the thing. Last week to capture what we were talking about with loving God with all your heart, we focused on loving God with your desires and, and, and the drive of your desires. This week, the word I want to focus on is your motivations, your motivations. I was thinking about, you know, even psychology, the study of mood and behavior. It, it's, psychology isn't the study of the behavior necessarily. It's like the why of the behavior, right? When we think about the psyche, it's the motivation behind what you're doing, not just what you're doing. What, who are you that does what you do? your motivations. Our desires that we talked about last week, if you think about desire, our desire, our love for God, our heart, it draws us to things. It draws us to the Lord. Conversely, maybe we could say our motivations drive us. Our desires are pulling us. Our motivations are what push us. I want you to write this down. If you take nothing else from this morning, I'm going to give it to you right off the bat. Our desires, we talked about last week, our desires need to be satisfied by God's love. Our desires need to be satisfied by his love. Our motivations need to be fueled by his grace. To grow in love for God in our heart, we need to receive his love. To grow in loving God with our soul, we need to grow in receiving his grace. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know about your psyche, your personality, uh, but I, for one, don't really want to grow in grace. <laughs> I kind of thought that the point of spiritually maturing was to need less grace. I don't want to grow in needing grace, I just want to get better. Come on, somebody, anybody else? I know it's not all of us, but some of us. I thought that maturing was about getting stronger and smarter and more disciplined and more perfect. You know, the more mature you get, the less grace you need. Praise the Lord. You know, spiritually mature people, I thought, need less grace because they are more mature. They are better Christians. They are better at praying. They sin less. They worship more. They cuss less. They read their Bibles more. Why would they need God's grace when they are spiritually mature? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church that he planted in the city of Corinth, and he is reflecting a bit on his own spiritual journey, and he writes some interesting things to them. At this point that Paul is writing this letter, he's everybody's best guess that at least I could find. He's about 20 years in the Lord at this point. He has completed two of his missionary journeys, and he planted Corinth during the second one. And I, as far as we can tell, you think he's on his third missionary journey as he writes it. He has already played a significant role in the Jerusalem Council, which was like a major meeting of all the big dogs, and he was a main speaker. He is a renowned apostle in the whole church. He has actually already even rebuked the apostle Peter for being hypocritical. It takes a big boy to stand up to Peter. He has escaped death threats. He's been beaten. He's been stoned. He's been left for dead. He has been hunted. He has been into prison. He is no baby Christian at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He is what you might call mature in the Lord. And we see that his spiritual maturity is marked not by a pride, but by a deep humility. By the time in his journey, when he is writing 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he can only recount his own deep encounters with the Lord to the church in Corinth in the third person. Listen to how 
He describes this. I should have marked this in my Bible. Have you noticed how often I don't mark where I'm going to... Thank you, Beth. Beth's noticed. <laughs> she giggled. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I, I don't know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. He's talking about himself, but he can only talk about himself in third person. He's, I, I, I so don't want to feel like this is about me. He's just talking about this man that he knows. He only changes to the first person when he begins to talk about not encountering the third heaven, which if you find that, let me know how to get there. He changes to the first person, not in talking about his encounter with the third heaven, but only when in talking about his encounter with the deep grace of God. Verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with my encounters in the third heaven. No, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. His resilience came from his reliance. His strength came from God being perfect in his weakness. He was deeper and more sanctified than ever when he wrote this because more than ever, he had a deep revelation of the grace of God. It sounds so obvious when you say it out loud, but it's so counterintuitive to our flesh. But spiritual maturity is marked by a great reliance on God's grace, not a greater reliance on your own strength. <laughs> I can't, have to, like, why do I have to say that out loud? I really just by myself think, the more spiritually mature I am, the more I can rely on my own strength. Spiritual maturity is marked by a great reliance on God's grace, not a greater reliance on your own strength. In fact, <laughs> grace is God saving you from living in your own strength. That's like what grace does. You and me, we were living in our own strength. That was going really well. <laughs> and God saved us in his grace. Spiritual maturity is the journey of growing in your reliance on God's grace, not growing out of your need of God's grace. If you could humor me and I could venture to give a paraphrase of 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 10 for this message this morning, it would be this. Because God's grace is sufficient for me and his power is made perfect in my weakness, I am no longer motivated by being strong, having everyone like me, things going the way I want them to go, being celebrated for being awesome and never encountering trouble. It is when I am strong in God's grace, by God's grace. It is when I am weak that I am strong in God's grace, by God's grace. 
I am not enough for myself, let alone for you. So I will boast all the more in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Grace. That is the sound of a soul set free and motivated by the grace of God. The more your soul experiences the freedom of God's grace, the more your soul will love God. This is the journey of grace that Jesus invites you into in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My soul began to experience this journey of grace in a brand new way when I was on my sabbatical the summer of 2022. I was meditating on these verses just about every day over those three months, and nothing was happening. After about nine weeks of nothing, the Lord just like touched my soul in a new way. I was spending time with the Lord, and he spoke a phrase to me that simultaneously it felt like I had never heard it before and also like I heard it every day for most of my life. I don't know how to explain that, so I'm not going to. That's just what it was like. And the phrase was, you better make the most of this. Just out of the blue, you better make the most of this. And it like... The Lord said it, and all these things were happening simultaneously in me, and I couldn't really explain it. And it was like, it was the Lord's voice, but it was like the Lord was saying something to me that he doesn't say. Again, I don't know how to explain it, but it just hit me, and it all made sense in that moment. I had never heard those words before, like with my ears or with my mind, but it was like my soul had been hearing that phrase every morning for probably over a decade in that silent moment right before your alarm goes off. It was some familiar voice of like a slave master that had been hitching that burden to my soul every day, and I didn't even realize it. I, I just was like, oh my gosh. I, yes. I am just always under that pressure. It just hit in this moment, like every moment, every interaction, every quiet moment, every busy moment, everything I do, everything I don't do, every decision, just this pressure, like you better make the most of this. And I thought that that was super righteous because it sounds so true. I'm sure a lot of you are like, I mean, That sounds like a good thing to do. It does sound like a good thing to do. And I, you know, I would look around my life and I would look at myself and I just was being honest, you know, and I'm like, I have such a a blessed life and I've had a blessed life and I have been given so much. And the Bible tells me that to whom much is given, much is required. And I've been given much. So yeah, like the Bible tells me I better make the most of this. All this is kind of happening in these few moments. And it was like, even in that moment, all of those thoughts I just shared with you are happening. And I, it's like, I know this is wrong, but I don't know what's wrong because it seems right. Something's off, but I didn't know what was off about it. So I asked the Lord what the problem was. <laughs> like, Lord, what? <laughs> I feel like you're telling me this is wrong, but I don't know what's wrong. So Lord, what, what's so wrong about this. You, you have given me so much and I'm expected to be a good steward and not waste what you have entrusted to me. So I don't understand what's going on here. And 
you know, honestly, some of you may like even disagree with me on this, but, <laughs> but what the Lord said to me was, Andrew, I haven't trusted you with anything. I've blessed you with everything. And I just like, it felt like the thing came unhitched. And again, it's just just like, whoa, it's all like, I was, I didn't know it, but I was treating all the blessings of God as these weighty expectations that God had trusted me with that I better not screw up. He was the rich master who had given me some of his stuff and I better make the most of it because I'm going to give it back in the end. It sounds so right. It sounds so much like that parable, doesn't it? But it's this perverted concept of stewardship. He isn't a rich master who had given his slave something to make the most of. He is a loving father who had poured out blessings on his son and he wants me to steward them with him not just for him. I'm, a, I'm not a slave, I'm a son. These, all these things, my life is not a burden to carry in my own strength. It is a blessing to steward with my father in his grace. This is the journey of Matthew 11 that Jesus invites us into. We put those verses back up again. This is the invitation to your soul that Jesus gives to you to be freed and healed and motivated by his grace. And this is the journey he marks out for us. Starts with, come to him. (laughs) All those people like me, don't run out and be like, I'm going to go figure this beast out. (laughs) No, 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 no. Come to me, Jesus says. Come to me. I didn't figure any of that out. Listen, I didn't figure anything out. I already told you, none of it even made sense. I didn't figure any of it out. I didn't evaluate it. It was just time coming to Jesus. I just was living a life coming to Jesus, and that day he decided it was time to tell me something. He says, come to me. And then he showed me. He shows you where you're heavy and weary and heavy laden. See, I didn't come to Jesus and say, God, well, I've been thinking about it and I got this burden figured out and now here's how I take it off and here's what I do. And I just, Lord, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm just coming to Jesus. Then he's the one who tells you what the burden is. He's the one who brings the things to light because he's the one who sees it. He brings it into his light with his voice and his timing. And then he gives you rest. You come to him and he teaches you what the burden is. Now don't run away yet. Because now he's going to teach you how to take it off. Learn from me. I'll give you rest for your souls. Here's what your burden is. Here's how you take that thing off. Don't run away yet. Then he teaches you what his yoke is, what his easy yoke is, what his light burden is. But don't run away yet. Then he's going to teach you how to put it on. Now, don't run away. Now he wants to walk with you in that every day. The journey of grace in Matthew 11 is come to Jesus. Let him show you the burdens that you're carrying. Let him teach you how to take them off. Let him teach you what his easy yoke is. Let him teach you how to put it on. And then every day, let him teach you how to walk in it. There is a, a couple that Heather and I have been learning a lot from in this area over the last several years. As I started looking and saying, uh, okay, great commandment says, love God with all my soul. Don't know where that is, what that is, or if I have one. Started looking around. Who's somebody who knows how to love God with all their soul and how do I get them to disciple me? And uh, we got connected to this ministry called Soul Shepherding this couple, their name is Bill and Christy Gaultier. They're both PhD psychologists. They're both intense disciples of Jesus. And they both each have like 30 plus years of practice of their psychology. So it's quite a unique combo there. I thought those folks might know what they're talking about. I really recommend their book, Journey of the Soul, FYI. There you go. 
they have an illustration for all that it is that we're talking about right now, this morning. And it starts with the cycle of works. The cycle of works that by default, in our sin, our souls are stuck in this cycle. We are motivated, our souls are motivated by expectations. We have this unconscious, subconscious, emotional belief that we need to measure up to certain conditions to feel acceptable to God, to please God, and to be acceptable to others. Those expectations become this, make us burdened then by this need for achievement. The pressure is on for achievement in our work, family, church, physical appearance, social media, whatever it is you're into, whatever it is, you get motivated by achievement and then that just works its way out in one or a bunch of different ways. We live by shoulds, especially spiritually. We should read the Bible every day. We should not miss church. We should be kind to everybody. We should help those in need, all good things, but motivated by achievement. We are motivated and feel the pressure to achieve whatever expectations we think God has of us. All of this then becomes this effort to build and protect our ego. Because you, you get all these expectations. It makes you insecure, so you try to achieve all the expectations. And now your life is a self-protection mechanism. To make sure that you think you look good to God, to others, and to yourself. You judge yourself, you judge others according to what you think the expectations are and how well you think you or them are living up to those expectations. You have to please God. And whatever you think about yourself and somebody else is directly related to how you think yourself and other people are or are not pleasing God. And all of this creates this need to stay in control, to not be vulnerable. And it creates this posture of self-reliant pride and earning. And it leaves you empty. One could say weary and heavy laden. And in all of that, you may get resentful, especially to God because you are trying to achieve all these things. You know, Lord, I'm doing all these things for you. What am I getting out of it? I did all the things. Why am I so empty? When we find that at the end of it, we still have all these holes in our souls, we just turn to other stuff. Media, sinful temptations, addictive behavior, whatever it is, makes you really extra vulnerable to anxiety, depression, unhealthy relationships, feeling distant from God. And of course, none of this helps you get closer to other people, which only then exacerbates the problem. At the end of it, our souls are empty. So we either quit or we just try harder, revisit the expectations, try to achieve even harder, or just find different expectations to try to live up to. And the cycle continues. But Ephesians 2 invites us into the cycle of grace. Instead of expectation, God gives you acceptance by grace. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved you, even when you were dead in your trespasses, made you alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. You are accepted in the grace of God. His grace energizes you, not just to live achieving for him, but to live with him in his grace. You were dead in your sins, but by his grace, verses 6 and 7 continue, he raises you up with him 
and he seats you with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that In the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards you in Christ Jesus. You aren't just working for a master and hopefully doing enough to please his expectations. You are accepted by God and by his grace. You get to participate with him as he shows you the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards you and towards all all in Christ Jesus. As he pulls you up and seats you with him in heavenly places, you get true self-esteem instead of a fragile ego. You get true self-esteem in grace. Verse eight says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one can boast, For we are his workmanship. That's who we are. We're God's workmanship. You don't need an ego when you know who you are by grace. It's like we said a few weeks ago in the message out of Luke 22. When you know who you are by grace, you don't have anything to prove or anything to gain from anyone else. Come on, somebody. Your salvation, your identity, your acceptance is by grace through faith, not by your works. God gave it to you as a gift because he loves you. You have nothing to boast in, which is fine because you have no need to boast. You are God's workmanship. He made you. He loves you. He's enough for you. And he's enough for everyone else. And the promise of this grace is fruit. Verse 10, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we walk in them. Your soul is free. God has made you and saved you. He loves you and he's with you and he has designed you to walk in his good works that he prepared for you to do in his grace. (laughs) It makes it so obvious that grace is powerful. Grace is what I want. And it makes it so obvious that we don't need to fall into that slippery slope of like grace means I'm free to do nothing. No, no, no. Grace says I'm free to walk in the good works of God. Dallas Willard says grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. And as we grow in receiving God's grace, our souls get set free from the fruitless and heavy Burdens that exhaust us. And we bear kingdom fruit, walking with Jesus in his easy yoke. Your soul doesn't just need rest from working. Your soul needs a revelation of grace. Come to him. Let him teach you what is wearing you down. Let him teach you how to take it off. Let him teach you his yoke. Let him teach you how to put it on and let him teach you how to walk in it. Grace. Grace. Matthew 11, Jesus invites you, come and receive my grace from me. Got a few more minutes. And so I want to land with something super practical because I don't know when else I'll be able to share this with everybody. So we're just going to go for it. Matthew 11, Jesus invites you. This is how you come and receive grace from Jesus. Another significant and essential way we receive the grace of God is from one another. (laughs) We are the body of Christ. God has given you all these people to be vehicles of his grace. 
but it is really darn scary, at least for people like me, to open up your soul, first to find it, and then crack that sucker open. <laughs> Try to find what's in there or not in there, and let somebody else in. Am I right? But we are, we are essential vehicles for the grace of God for one another. And there, is, there are revelations of grace that none of us will step into without other people, without the church. So I want to talk super practically. How do we give grace to one another? Amen? The, if we're going to kind of capture this in a word... We could, talk, we could call this empathy, which we've talked about before. And some of you really hate that word. I kind of hate the word, but it's true. Empathy. So to kind of avoid the pitfall of like, eh, I don't know what I think about that word. We're going to talk about listening with grace. That's what empathy is. That's as we're talking about. A lot of people give a lot of definitions. We're talking about listening with grace. What does it mean to listen with grace? Because when we talk about empathy, it, what we're talking about, sympathy is like, I feel bad for you. Empathy is like, I'm actually going to step in to feel with you. I want to come into your world. Both are good, but they're different. And Bill and Christy Gaultier, they say, empathy is oxygen for our souls. And I would say the reason it's oxygen for our souls is because that's grace. It takes grace to come in to my world to listen. Are you tracking with me? Because why, why do I relate empathy and grace? Because grace is unhurried. Grace is not intimidated or nervous about weakness. Grace doesn't judge imperfections. It takes grace to just come in and be here to listen. That's why I say listening with grace. Grace covers. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. It covers you. If we're gonna give grace and listen with grace, we have to understand that when it comes time to listen with grace, we're listening and we're covering. We're not intimidated. We're not hurried. We're here. Now, before we get into this, I just want to say, I know this is like, if, if you're anything like me, this is like a lot of like, ooh, touchy-feely. I don't know. <laughs> like, let's go blow stuff up. <clears throat> <laughs> so, you know, empathy, soul talk, we're going to go along, but not sorry. Because um, this will change your ever-loving life. Um, this can be hard for some people, and I'm just going to say it like it is, especially us dudes. We're like, eh, or we could just avoid all this. Wouldn't that be quicker? <laughs> okay, so if that's you and or you're a man, listen. <laughs> Do you want relationship with God? Well, he says you have a soul. <laughs> And he says that you should love him with it. Which means that relationship with him includes knowing him, experiencing him, and responding back to him with your soul. A little intimidating, but it's awesome. Because he's right about everything, isn't he? He's been right so far. You can trust him. Next question. Do you want relationship with your wife or your wife someday? Okay. She's a woman. And she is like way more aware of all this stuff, probably. Do you want relationship with your kids that you have today or someday? Well, they are children. They are children. And uh, the woman that you want to be closest to the most and the children that you so badly want to be close to live naturally way more in these emotional realities than you do. Even the older kids that you have, they may be adults, but they're still your children. And they are hardwired to have a need to connect with you emotionally. 
It just is how it is. So the woman that you are married to or will be married to and the children that you have or will have are wired to need and desire emotional connection with you. And that then means you are hardwired to impact them in a unique way that nobody else on planet earth can do. Okay, so either you learn how to live in their world or you sit back and wait for them to come to you. And I think we know which one we need to lean into. It's your choice, but I think it's obvious. That's all I'll say about that. How do we give grace to others? We're going to talk about real quick <clears throat> what Bill and Christy called their four A's of empathy. We even got a slide for you. Listening with grace starts with ask to talk. I'm going to call men out right now if you're not taking notes right now. Some other dude ought to bop you on the head. Ask to talk. We're not going to do this song. We don't have time. Sorry, Diego. <clears throat> I appreciate you, though. Always ready. Number one, ask to talk. Ask to talk. All right. I don't know how to do all this. I don't know how to do all this either. You can ask simple questions. What would you like to share? Wife? I don't know why that's funny. I'm serious. I asked that question. <laughs> Is there anything you want to talk about? Here's a good one. What can I ask you about? So if somebody, if anybody in this room, if you get asked any of these questions, come on, let's meet at least halfway, right? Something that Kirk Freeman, who's coming for Kingdom Conference, told me this blew my mind and changed my life. Simple response when my wife shares something or my kids or now anybody in my life. If you are in relationship with me at all, you hear me say this all the time. Tell me more about that. If you want to connect with your wife or your children or another human being, say that three times before you say anything else in a conversation. I'm so dead serious. It's really cool. Tell me more about that. So when you are asking to talk, it means you're not rushing to fix because grace isn't hurried, right? I know she's telling you about all the things that you know the answer to, but we're not here to fix it. We're here to connect. We're here for a relationship. We're here to give grace. And frankly, you need a lot less fixing and a lot more grace than you think you do anyways too. So, you know, like dudes, men, this is what our wives are looking for when they say don't fix it. They're looking for, tell me more about that, not here's an idea. And this, okay, this is often also what your child needs in an emotional kind of breakdown. This has changed the way that I interact with my kids a hundred times a day. To realize that their emotions need my grace, not my fix. So you can like that or not like it, but it's true. And if you want to connect with them and be a safe place for your children, give grace first. So when your child's going crazy, it's the last thing you want to do, but hey, tell me more about that. Tell me what's going on. Let's dig in. Share it all, because I'm not in a hurry. And I'm not intimidated by the fact that you're losing your mind. <laughs> you know you're losing your mind. I know you're losing your mind. Everybody knows you're losing your mind. And you know everybody knows. And you're nervous. And you're insecure. And you're scared. But I'm good. I'm covering you. Tell me more about that. Number two, attune to emotions. Don't get scared of what your wife or child or friend says when you say, how are you feeling? Like, ooh, I don't know what to do with those. I still feel that way with tears. Like, oh, what do we do with tears? Why are you crying? Don't, don't ask that. Just <laughs> attune to emotions. I see that you're crying. That's better than why are you crying, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> Give me a break. I'm a kindergartner in this stuff. <laughs> At least I'm trying. <laughs> Attune to emotions. Start just say things like, okay, it sounds like you feel. Just reflect back. So I'm angry and I'm scared. I hear you saying you're angry and scared. 
It sounds silly, but watch. <laughs> like, yeah, it's exactly what I said and how I'm feeling. Or, you know, like this, this may or may not happen often in my house. It sounds like you feel the responsibility of being the oldest child. It sounds like you're frustrated that you're, like, you're not able to do as good of a job parenting, homeschooling, cleaning, whatever it is that you feel like you ought to do. It sounds like you're frustrated by that. Or I hear you saying this, that, or the other thing. It seems like you're struggling with, it seems like you're experiencing. Try to, try to get in there. And the beauty of this is you don't have to be right. Just engage. I, it sounds like you're really angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm, you're just helping get the motor going. You're making space. You're covering. You're covering. Number three, acknowledge significance. <clears throat> acknowledge the significance of what's going on. Really simple. That's a lot. You know? So you're parenting your kid, and it's your oldest child who freaked out on the younger ones because they wouldn't do what the older ones said, even though they're not in charge, and you know that, and you've been telling them not to do that. It's like, hey, tell me what's going on. And they're, I don't know. Sounds like you feel the responsibility of being the oldest child. Yes. Yes. And you're frustrated because you're trying to help, and they won't listen, which makes you more frustrated, and now you want to control them because you feel like you ought to do that because you know what's right. Yes, exactly. That's a lot. It must be hard, like, feeling that responsibility all the time. You, it's not, you don't feel that responsibility. There you go. Just stop. <laughs> Man, that's a lot. That, that's a lot. That's a lot to carry. You're trying to carry two other kids, three other kids. You know, you're, you're just, you're only however old you are. You know, like, it sounds like that's really hard to do. Or, you know, I, I see you're working really hard around the house and you feel like you're working really hard, and you're carrying a lot. It's, it's kind of discouraging. It's discouraging, isn't it, when you feel like you're working really hard, but nothing's paying off? Like, yes! Yeah, that's tiring. That's not fun. You could just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not fun. I'm sorry you feel out of control. I'm sorry that person hurt you. I'm sorry you felt hurt by that person, even though I don't understand what the heck hurt, that, hurt you about all that. Just, I'm sorry that you feel that way. That's not fun to feel that way. I'm sorry you don't feel appreciated. Last is affirm strengths. So notice how we haven't done any cheerleading yet. Sometimes our cheerleading is a workaround for the process of grace. No, you're fine, you're great, you're doing awesome. Just let it simmer for a second cover. Don't be hurried. Affirm strengths. I'm really proud of you for caring that much. I'm, you're doing a great job. <laughs> this is where you can say, no, I hear all that. Oh, I'm really sorry you feel that way. But can I remind you like yesterday when I came in the house, I saw you doing this, 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 and this, and I got really appreciated that. You're actually doing a really good job like, okay, okay. But I get how, like, that thing that happened today kind of undid all that. But you're, you're doing a great job. Here's where I see you doing a great job. Now that you have given grace, you can give encouragement. Now you can ask the question, may I offer a suggestion? Yes, we got there. Until they say, no, never mind, I'm fine. <laughs> you're like, well, this was my time to shine. And I want to close the loop on something really important. Now's the time for the discipline, for the kids, or the correction, or the leadership. I'm not saying just be nice and everything goes away. Absolutely give discipline. But maybe just extend the runway a little bit and trust the Lord to empower discipline with grace. Discipline still does not feel pleasant at the time, right? I'm not getting funky, give all the discipline that is needed. But now you and him and her 
are in a better place for this. <laughs> now you can be in a better place of disciplining and love than everybody just reacting out of emotions. Try those out. It's not just about being nicer and softer. This is the power of God to experience and receive revelation of grace from him and from his people. And I believe, because the Bible teaches, that that will lead us in freedom and that we will experience the rest of Jesus in our souls. I want to pray for you as we wrap up. Um, if you have your kids and you can, go out and grab them real quick. Uh, we're still going to have our prayer team come up maybe over here. Prayer folks, come over here. If you need prayer for anything, please do not leave without getting prayer. Um, Jesus, thank you for your invitation into your grace. I pray that you would grow us in your grace. I pray that we would cover one another with grace. I pray that all of us would uh, be really adamant about receiving more grace from you. And that as a byproduct, we would have so much more grace to give each other and to give grace to the people that we love and give grace to the world that you love. We invite your power in our weaknesses. Make us a people who are content in our weakness and boast in our need for you, Lord Jesus. Give us grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you so much. Have an incredible week and the grace of God.